We would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Bikani, and the Kena First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Thank you very much, Monique. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Danielle C. McRae to the University of Calgary. I'm very pleased uh, to have her here today. Let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. McRae. She did a, a, a JD at Harvard Law School in 1999. I was studying your CV and it's amazing. Um, uh, and Master of Divinity at Virginia Theological Seminary in 2006 and her Doctor of Theology at Duke Divinity School in 2014. And at previous stages in her career, Dr. McRae has been a hospice chaplain and also an attorney. And since 2016, she is Associate Professor of Homiletics at Yale Divinity School. And her scholarship focuses on African-American preaching, sermon, genre, and modes of authority, things that are very near and dear to my heart. Um, her many publications, I'll just read out a few of uh, uh, books uh, recently, The Censored Pulpit, Julian of Norwich as Preacher, which was published in 2019. And in 2021, co-authored with Thomas G. Long, A Surprising God, Advent, Advent Devotions for an Uncertain Time. And also a number of journal articles, uh, including Black Feminist Triptych, which appears in the journal Homiletic in uh, volume 45 from 2020. And uh, another article, Playing in Church, Insights from the Boundaries of Sermon Genre, which appears in Liturgy, the journal Liturgy, uh, volume 36, 2021. And this one I'm really anxious to read. Uh, I'd love to look at this uh, as soon as possible. On Shrieking the Truth, uh, Mary M. Placometary Wailing in the Journal Interpretation, Volume 75, that came out in 2021. Now, presently, Dr. McRae is working on three uh, distinct projects. One is a documentary film uh, and experimental multimedia project called In the Basement, Race, Church, and Theological Practices. And this focuses on Dr. McRae's deep concern of the workings of race in the church, as well as materiality and space. So that's one project. A second project is uh, a monograph is it a sermon, genre fluidity in African-American preaching? And this in some ways is reflective, I think, of what Dr. McRae will be speaking about tomorrow when uh, she delivers the Chair of Christian Thought Bentel Lecture, Quilter as Truth Teller, Harriet Powers, Rosie Lee Tompkins, and their Stitch Sermons, which I'll say more about at the end. I'm really looking forward to that, uh, to that talk as well. And the third project is another monograph, The Apostle Pauli, an exploration into Pauli Murray's spirituality and her contributions to homiletics. And in many ways, I would say that this project touches upon and is associated with Dr. McRae's talk today, which is what counts as charism, discerning signs of race, of grace in the life of Pauli Murray. Dr. Dr. McRae, welcome to the University of Calgary. Thank you so much for finding the time to, to give um, uh, this talk today and tomorrow, welcome. Thank you and thank you for such a kind and thorough introduction. Um, I'm so happy that we have this time together and it's important that I too begin with a land acknowledgement Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden, Golden Hill Pagosset, Nihantic, the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquian speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands 
and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. Now, I wish I could greet you in person in Calgary rather than from my living room, um, but I'm thankful for this opportunity to talk about Polly Murray. And first, a word about pronouns. This lecture focuses on Polly Murray, a freedom fighter, attorney, poet, an Episcopal priest, and a person for whom self-definition was very costly. The barriers were many and varied, and one concerns language itself. Polly Murray lived from 1910 to 1985. Today, most scholars describe Polly as genderqueer or gender nonconforming, but these descriptors were not available during that time, and nor were the array of preferred gender pronouns commonly used today. In conversation, I typically use she and they pronouns to talk about Polly Murray, but for today's lecture, I'll be using she, her pronouns, and I do so for a few reasons. First, to accurately reveal the binary world in which Polly lived and acknowledge the fact that Polly had less agency around expressing gender identity than many of us do today. Gender queer people commonly used binary pronouns during Pauli's lifetime in the US context. Second, to maintain consistency in quotations in which Pauli uses she series pronouns or claims womanhood or daughterhood. Third, to provide a context for dialogical exchanges which were inflected by assumptions of race and gender. And then finally, and if we can share slide A, to reflect Pauli's intentional usage of she, her pronouns in ministry contexts during the advent of women's ordination, as shown in this ministry license where Pauli has stricken through the his references and replace them with her. Polly only chose to share her gender identity with a small inner circle that included lovers, close friends, and select family members. It would be misleading to suggest that Polly was out. I'm mindful that terms that great Polly at one period of life are embraced at another period. And in every case, I try to honor the fullness of Polly's identity and the need for visibility. I respect the fact that we are working with historical fragments and don't know which pronouns Polly would use today. Scholars are taking different approaches and everyone that I've spoken with is taking those approaches with great humility, which I share. So I just wanted to give you that context before launching in. Polly Murray's identity and legacy of activism have generated increased attention in recent years, yet her spirituality has received far less attention. Indeed, her ordination to the priesthood at age 66 is sometimes treated as kind of an exclamation point on a life of activism. Yet in my forthcoming project, The Apostle Polly, I contend that Polly had a long-standing an evolving faith that actually propelled activism. While Polly was at times in tension with her church, the Episcopal Church USA, it played a defining role in her identity. Exploring Polly's charisms or spiritual gifts provides a helpful window into the shape of her ministry. So during this lecture, I'll first offer a fairly detailed biographical sketch to give you a sense of the full arc of Polly Murray's life. Second, I'll talk briefly about Polly's conception of God and the human person. Then I'll turn to spiritual gifts, reflecting on the biblical foundation and Polly's understanding. 
And then I'll home in on Pauli's spiritual gifts, offering vignettes from her ministry. And then finally, I'll turn to you and invite your questions. I'm eager to hear what this opens up for you. So there's growing interest in Polly Murray's life, but um, Polly is still not very well known. And so first a biographical sketch, and we can begin with slide B here. Polly Murray was born November 20th, 1910 in Baltimore, Maryland, the fourth of six children born to Agnes Fitzgerald Murray, a nurse, and William Murray, a school principal, and they're both shown here in, in slide C. When Polly was baptized on July 9th, 1911 at St. James Episcopal Church in Baltimore, the Reverend George Freeman Bragg presided. After the baptism, the rite set forth in the Book of Common Prayer instructed Reverend Bragg to give hearty thanks to God for receiving this child as thine own child by adoption. The words would ring true in painful ways. In March of 1914, Agnes, just 35 years old and expecting the couple's seventh child, died of a stroke. William was in a years long battle with mental illness and was unable to care for the children by himself. Polly and her siblings were separated and cared for by other relatives. Little Polly went down to Durham, North Carolina to live with her aunt Pauline Dame, a namesake, and her maternal grandparents, Robert and Cornelia Smith Fitzgerald. But shortly afterwards, tragedy struck again. In 1917, William's condition worsened and he was committed to the Crownsville State Hospital, the hospital for uh, the Negro insane of Maryland. The social stigma associated with his confinement would trouble the family for decades. Then in 1923, William became the victim of a racially motivated attack. He was beaten to death by an inexperienced hospital guard. After her parents died, Polly's other relatives told vivid stories about them that gave her a sense of their abiding presence. And throughout her life, she spoke of her parents as, quote, guiding lights, reaching out to her from the invisible world. And here we have slide D. As early as age eight, Polly preferred wearing what was then considered boys' clothing. Later, young Polly would confide that she felt, quote, inwardly male and outwardly female. Aunt Pauline responded with endearment, calling Polly, quote, my little boy girl. In addition to honoring Polly's choice of clothing, Aunt Pauline allowed Polly to chop wood and take up a paper route, roles typically reserved for boys. Church served as a space where Aunt Pauline was less flexible. At St. Titus Episcopal Church, Polly was required to wear dresses and respect the church's rule of only allowing boys to serve as acolytes. Despite these restrictions, Polly described church as an extension of the family home. As a teenager, she had a prophetic moment when taken to the deathbed of Bishop Henry B. Delaney. He was the first African-American bishop in the Episcopal Church assigned to Negro work. And she was taken to Bishop Delaney to receive his blessing. The bishop blessed Polly and called her a child of destiny, a moniker that would continue to guide Polly for the rest of her life. While Polly's baptism and birth certificates read Anna Pauline Murray, Polly used several names that reflect a more fluid gender identity, including Paul, Pete, and Pixie, but legally changed her name to Polly. As a child, 
Polly felt loved and accepted by her immediate family and the black community, but humiliated by Durham's racial segregation, the activity of the Klan, and the constant threat of racialized violence. The black church was a refuge. Its work was to incubate the community's fragile hope and envelop people with gentleness. For example, during the 1918 flu pandemic, Polly remembers that the schools closed and that her aunt Sally, a school teacher, served as a volunteer nurse for sick members of the African-American community. She did this as part of her ministry. And this kind of support was critical because state resources were distributed on a segregated basis. At the same time, the church was a bastion of respectability. As M. Sean Copeland explains, an aesthetics of submission defined the central images, symbols, metaphors, narrative interpretations, traditions, and rituals of Christian practice. So the church offered safety to those who conformed, but not complete freedom. As soon as it was possible, Polly left Durham. And maybe we can share slide E here. In 1928, she moved to New York and attended Hunter College, matriculating slowly due to limited finances. During the Great Depression, Polly worked as a waitress, dishwasher, typist, switchboard operator, basically anything to pay the bills. And as dire as the situation was in New York, and it was dire, I mean, Polly missed meals, going back to a segregated existence in North Carolina was not an option. Polly compared it to living under Nazi rule. Yet finding true community in New York was challenging. Curious about ways to resist authoritarianism, and learn from freedom movements around the world, she lived for a time in a Harlem ashram, a small intentional community guided by Christian scriptures, Gandhian principles, and a commitment to resist colonialism. But she found the community rigid and got annoyed when they wouldn't let her smoke her cigarettes. Polly felt writing poetry was really her true work but the opportunities to do so were just very scarce. In 1938, Polly applied to the sociology department of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, but was denied admission due to her race, even though some of her white ancestors donated money at the school's inception. During the 1940s, Polly focused on racial equality she led a freedom campaign for Odell Waller, an uh, African-American man wrongfully charged and convicted of murder. Polly also challenged Jim Crow laws. She was jailed in Virginia for protesting segregated seating on a Greyhound bus. This was long before Rosa Parks' experience. And Polly led successful sit-ins at two Washington, D.C. restaurants long before the Greens, for the, before the sit-ins um, from the 1960s. Now, her church attendance became sporadic during this time, but she connected activism to enacting God's justice in the world. Polly enrolled in Howard University Law School, and while there, came up with an argument to unsettle the doctrine of separate but equal in Plessy versus Ferguson. Other students chuckled when she shared this idea in class, but her argument later became a key resource for Thurgood Marshall and Spotswood Robinson in the Brown versus Board of Education cases. Later, she had a very public fight with Harvard Law School after she applied to their advanced legal program and was denied admission because the school only accepted men. The rejection letter read, your picture 
and the salutation on your college transcript indicate that you are not of the sex entitled to be admitted to Harvard Law School. Typical legal channels were closed due to Harvard's status as a private institution. In a final attempt to find a way forward, she wrote a letter to the faculty. Gentlemen, I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements, but since the way to such change has not been revealed to me, I have no recourse but to appeal to you to change your minds on this subject. Are you to tell me that one is as difficult as the other? When Harvard refused to lift its restrictions, Pauli attended the University of California and began a career as a civil rights attorney. She served briefly as Deputy Attorney General of California and on the legal staff of the American Jewish Congress before joining Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, a major law firm in New York. There, Pauli mentored a young intern, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who later became um, a Supreme Court Justice. The two would later co collaborate on pivotal sex discrimination cases. Then Pauli lived for a time in Accra, where she taught law at the University of Ghana and helped author its constitution and canons. Upon returning to the United States, she studied at Yale Law School and in 1965 earned a doctoral degree in law. She was cheered for being the first African-American woman to do so. Throughout this time, Polly's commitment to nonviolent activism never wavered. In the mid to late 1960s, when some questioned the efficacy of peaceful protests, Polly's response showed clear resolve. Quote, we should not permit the terrorism unleashed against the civil rights movement or the desperate release of frustrations in urban riots to obscure the significance of disciplined nonviolence in the resolution of social conflict. It is more revolutionary than the violent overthrow of an established order because it is an invisible weapon which cannot be confiscated, and its strength resides in the great untapped resource of moral power, which cannot be exhausted. While publicly, landed, while publicly lauding the work of Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Pauli went on the record privately to raise concerns about the ways women were sidelined in the movement for racial justice. Polly named her car, a black Volkswagen, Sojourner Truth. Driving in it to protest was a reminder of the pioneering witness of black women of faith. Polly helped found the National Organization for Women and also focused on race, gender, and civil rights as a professor at Brandeis University, where she taught from 1968 to 1973. Around this time, in her early 60s, Polly discerned a call to ordained ministry, which she saw as consistent with all her prior work. She had long since known herself to be a prophet and truth bearer, and now this vocation could be acknowledged publicly. She gave up her chaired, tenured professorship and applied to seminary. And now if we could see slide F. From the start, it was clear that Polly was an atypical student. Her seminary application includes multiple areas where she has corrected the application and instructed the school not to assume all applicants were men. She responds to several of the questions on the form with sarcastic remarks. Have you ever seen a physician regarding emotional or mental difficulties? The form asks. Who hasn't, she responds. What part did you take in student athletics and activities? Her response, hardly applicable at this late date, wouldn't you think? 
These early tensions foreshadowed what would be a tough journey, one she described as more demanding than earning a law degree or doctorate. As a seminarian, Polly wrote, I live with the tension of the contemplative, spiritually directed person and the warrior activist reformer. I need to integrate these two opposites in preparation for the priesthood. And while I'm at it, the bishopric. Polly also discovered she had hearing difficulties during this time. This hindered her comprehension of lectures and strained individual conversations with other students until she got hearing aids. Despite the many challenges of seminary, on January 8th, 1977, Polly was ordained a priest. News headlines as far as Australia celebrated her as the first African-American female priest in the Episcopal Church USA. All the strands of my life had come together, she wrote. Now, a lover of words, Polly authored several books, including two legal texts, a memoir, a book of poetry, and an autobiography. Her aim was to write a volume on her spiritual journey as well. Polly was briefly married to William Wynne, but the union lasts less than a week. Her most significant relationships were with women. She and Irene Barlow shared a deep bond that lasted more than 16 years. Polly Murray died of pancreatic cancer on July 1st, 1985, and was buried next to Irene, whom she called her silent partner. Polly once said, if anyone should ask a Negro woman what is her greatest achievement, her honest answer would be, I survived. Faith was instrumental to this survival. Polly needed a faith that would help her live on the horizon, a faith that would help her move against the grain and provide the inner resources for facing resistance. Spirituality that only comforted her after experiences of loss would not suffice. She needed her spirituality to kindle risk-taking and to kindle dreaming. So now I turn to who God was for Pauli. Given um, her many experiences of loss, failure, and loneliness, a vibrant vision of God and of divine action was indispensable. Amid the perplexities of life, God was her, quote, one true light. She had a pattern of referring to God as divine guidance, one who was always leading, though the manner of that leading and the path ahead may be inscrutable to us. And God was not imagined as a distant figure who, enge who engineered human action from afar. Instead, the spirit was, quote, as close as the touch of a loved one's hand. Yet this is not a sentimental vision. Polly understood God to be one who continually upended human expectations one who emboldens human beings to take risks, face the past and its claims on the present, and make the beloved community a reality. As a child, Polly was introduced to images of God as Father, King, and Lord. But in her 60s and 70s, she sought other images of the divine, like the image of, like the image of God as a woman in labor in Isaiah 42, 14, and the image of God as a midwife in Isaiah 66, 9. These images of the divine suggested a spirituality that was, to draw on the words of one scholar, driven more by tension than resolution. Polly had a very high view of human beings. She believed in the Imago Dei, the notion that Human beings were created in the image and likeness of God and carry innate dignity. 
more, they have the capacity to serve as channels for divine love. And this capacity is most defining, and this capacity to channel love is most defining of human identity. Pauli had a pattern of stressing this idea. And as just one example, um, in a Father's Day sermon given in June of 1975, here's what she says. To think of oneself as a child of God is a liberating experience. It is to free oneself from all feelings of inferiority, whether of race or color or sex or age or economic status or position in life. When I say that I am a child of God, made in his image, the theologians like to use the term imago Dei, I imply that black is beautiful, that white is beautiful, that red is beautiful, or yellow is beautiful. I do not need to make special pleading for my sex, male, female, or in between. I do not need to make a special pleading to bolster self-esteem. When I truly believe that God is my father and mother, in short, my creator, I am bound also to believe that all men, women, and children of whatever race, color, creed, or ethnic origin are my sisters and brothers in Christ, whether they are Anglicans, Roman Catholics, Methodists, Black Muslims, members of the Judaic faith, Russian Orthodox, Buddhists, or atheists. So this is a mouthful. It's an expansive way of thinking about the human person. And statements like these appear repeatedly in Pauli's sermons and speeches. Pauli believed that each individual Christian expressed God's grace in a unique way through spiritual gifts or charisms, from which we get the terms charisma and charismatic. These gifts come from the Holy Spirit, and the teachings about them stem from the Apostle Paul, whom Pauli considered her first namesake. We find full descriptions in three New Testament epistles, Romans and 1 Corinthians, um, which were written by the Apostle Paul, and Ephesians, written by one of Paul's protégés. In Romans 12, Paul writes, we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence. The compassionate in cheerfulness. He offers more detail in 1 Corinthians. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. And then finally, Ephesians. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, 
for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. So in each case, the charisms are, in are intended not just to enrich the life of the individual believer, but to help them nourish the life of the entire faith community and the broader world. One New Testament scholar, Leander Keck, aptly calls charisms begracements, as they are understood as different expressions of the same divine grace. He notes that in the Epistle to Romans, the gracements are not routinized into offices. They are expressed spontaneously, freely, and problem-free. Now, historically, charisms have grounded how the church thinks about vocation and authority, though that thinking has been shaped by assumptions about gender. Despite the history of female apostles, like Unia, or female prophets, like Miriam, Hulda, and Deborah, there has been a pattern of celebrating um, and nurturing prophetic gifts in men um, and devaluing them in women. Pauli recognized this pattern and sought to interrupt it. And more, rather than imagining the charisms as a finite list um, enumerated in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians, Pauli treated the biblical list as a springboard for honoring a variety of gifts to, that people use to build up the church or to help the church meet the true mission of love and justice. In a sermon entitled, Gifts of the Holy Spirit to Women I Have Known, given at St. Philip's Episcopal Church on May 14, 1978 in Durham, North Carolina, Polly understands the charisms to include the prophecy of her grandmother, Cornelia Smith Fitzgerald, because of her passionate truth telling and um, Cornelia's gifts for making up expressive words. Teaching includes not only the teaching gifts of clergy, but those of her aunt Pauline Dame, a school teacher. And healing reflects the gifts of her mother Agnes, a nurse. Yet Polly also envisions the gifts of the spirit to include the generosity, honesty, compassion, and sense of mission seen in Eleanor Roosevelt. And the gift of laughter in her aunt Sally, who had a habit of quote, seeing the absurdities of the human condition in the midst of woe. Polly also describes herself as the daughter of a mentor, Susie Elliott, who had the gift of living creatively. And um, this was as, as Susie, Susie Elliott was adapting to living as a 90 year old. In that sermon, Polly referred to the charisms explicitly, but she had a pattern of referring to them implicitly as well in other sermons and in tributes to people she admired. In both cases, Polly understood charisms to include specific roles in the church and virtues that enable people to come to voice and contribute to the work of love and justice. Indeed, such action was at the heart of what it meant to be church. Polly did not think of the church as a building or uh, primarily as an institution, but in William Stringfellow's words, a happening or an event that flashes up whenever people come together in love. This vision required a more expansive view of charisms. Polly had an equally creative approach when reflecting on her own spiritual gifts. In a draft of a letter to the Faculty of General Theological Seminary in January of 1974, Polly wrote, to survive in a hostile society, which was not geared for the success of one born Negro in USA, a woman in a male dominated world, a single career professional woman, a left handed person in a right handed society, one has to be scrappy. And I am proud of it. Here and elsewhere, Pauli embraces scrappiness 
as a virtue. Now, truculence is not what Polly has in mind here. Scrappy refers to a combination of courage, determination, and grit. It's um, a plucky tenacity. And though proud of being scrappy, one wonders whether it's a gift Polly would have chosen um, because it tends to parallel difficult life circumstances. In any case, scrappiness emerged when offering a disciplined and urgent response to social problems. It helped her confront issues and refuse to back down without first seeking earnest engagement um, with people in authority when resolving uh, conflicts. And uh, if we could share slide G here. Polly regularly engaged in what she called confrontation by typewriter. And you can see just the edge of her typewriter uh, to her right. Confrontation by typewriter involved hundreds of letters. Some were open letters to public officials and others were written to individuals. Polly drew on the Apostle Paul's practice of preaching through letters and using letters to address conflicts and moral questions. In 1977, just days after her historic ordination, Polly received a copy of a letter addressed to her bishop. And it was sent by the Reverend James Watley from the Coalition for the Apostolic Ministry. The letter objected to Polly's ordination, stating that it would cause grave scandal. And he noted that he and the members of the coalition would not accept the sacramental acts of Polly's ministry, meaning among other things, that they would consider her consecration of the Eucharist invalid and refuse to receive it. I'll share just a portion of her response. Dear Reverend Watley, I begin with the principle that as baptized members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, you and I belong to the royal priesthood of all believers, that we are brother and sister in Christ, that we must love one another as ourselves and that we must bear one another's burdens. Since my ordination to the priesthood has contributed to your anguish, which motivates your letter of January 13, I must bear some responsibility for your pain. Only the deepest kind of pain could make a member of the ordained clergy go to the very brink of violating his ordination vows. Obviously, when you wrote that letter, you did not know who I am. So let me tell you who I am. First and foremost, I am a child of God and no other human being on this planet is inferior to or superior to me. In addition, I am a seven generation Episcopalian. The public record within our church shows that my grandmother was baptized in the Chapel of the Cross on Wednesday, December 20th, 1854 at the age of 10. This brings me to the crux of our differences. We differ on the theology which underlies your letter and increasingly the weight of theological opinion attests to the rightness of the church's decision to approve explicitly the ordination of women to the priesthood. I am deeply sympathetic to the anguish you and the members of your coalition must feel to have overturned one of your most deeply held articles of faith, comparable to the belief in racial superiority which has brought our nation to bloodshed and grief all too often in its short history. So in this letter, Polly asserts that she belongs in the Episcopal Church and will not back down on the question of women's ordination. Reverend Watley responds shortly afterwards, telling Polly not to underestimate the sharpness of his pain or his determination to witness to his conviction he prays that their differences will not lead them into an ecclesiastical court. Polly writes again on February 10, saying, 
I have nothing further to add and would suggest that you counsel with your own diocesan bishop and the chancellor of your diocese. In further response to your letter, I ask that you join me in the following prayer. O oh God, you have bound us together in a common life. In all our struggles for justice, help us to confront one another without hatred or bitterness and to work together with mutual forbearance and respect. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Now, there are many more details to this exchange, but suffice it to say that the letters reveal two people doing their best to disagree in love. And during this episode, Pauli is journaling about the Apostle Paul and reading the epistles. What Pauli was trying to do in letters was simulate a face-to-face -face encounter. She believed in the productivity of argumentation, that the back and forth that comes with examining difference helped people attain a deeper level of truth. Scrappiness was virtuous because it propelled this process of truth seeking. Now in the exchange with Reverend Watley, Polly spoke as a representative of the church, but she had a high view of the individual speaking without an organizational backing. Many of her letters reflect a solo voice aiming to quote, get on the conscience of the other, trusting that the power of the Holy Spirit is behind me. I do my part and leave the results to God. She sometimes confronted corporations this way in the hope of making them more humane. Here's just an excerpt of a letter to Exxon in 1980. Her letter is addressed to the Vice President of Customer Relations. Dear Exxon, Will you go out of business if a customer is two days late in paying the monthly bill? I seriously doubt it, having read in the financial pages of the Washington Post and seen over television those astronomical profits you have made over the past year. Now, dear Exxon, I have been a customer of Esso, then Exxon, since the 1930s. Why don't you take a look at my credit record with your company? and see how often I have been late with a payment. I enclose my check for the current bill in the amount of $16. And this portion of the letter is, on, is in all caps. I have no intention of paying the 14 cents finance charge. And if you press the point, I'll cancel my credit card and go to another company. Having expressed my anger, let me tell you why my payment was late. On January 31st, I was admitted to the hospital and diagnosed myocardial infarct, meaning a heart attack, kept in the coronary care unit for five or six days and released on February 12th under severe restrictions for the next two or three months. Since I live alone, there was no one to pay my bills or do the necessary things until a friend could secure the keys to my apartment. Even then, she could not find the Exxon bill until I came home and was well enough to go through a pile of mail. If computers are going to rob us of human relationships, perhaps it would be better if we got rid of computers. Which do you want? My continued patronage or the 14 cents? Yours for Humanizing Society, the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray. A couple weeks later, Polly received a letter from Exxon waiving the 14 cent charge and thanking her for the opportunity to serve her and including a personal contact in the event that she had other questions. I should note that Polly was not inclined to write letters simply to voice anger. Her archive includes a hefty file of letters not sent. When mailing a letter, Polly expected a response or an active role in working towards resolution. Confrontation by typewriter was a means of claiming her quote, pix pixie prophetic background and communing with those scrappy eighth century BC prophets, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah and Micah, 
and with Paul the apostle, whose name I bear, end quote. Another of Pauli's charism is tenderness. Now this might seem at odds with scrappiness, but the two actually work in tandem. While scrappiness reflected justice-driven advocacy for people and causes she believed in, tenderness reflected her own relationships towards those she um, felt called to care for and protect. Tenderness was evident at the start of Pauli's ministry. And perhaps um, the most sacred task of the priesthood is to be with someone um, at their deathbed. And uh, Pauli performed this uh, role for her aunt Pauline because no pr priest was available. She read scripture, she prayed, and offered the final words of blessing before she died. Years later, during the final illness of Rini Barlow, the love of her life, Pauli played a similar role by praying by her side. Remembering those moments, Pauli wrote, I found myself speaking of the decision she was making with God, that if she went on, she would be with all those loved ones who had gone before her, that if she decided to stay with us, we would be with her all the way. Then I went outside and sat in the solarium nearby, thinking about death. Suppose death is a loving mother waiting to enfold us in a protective embrace. Polly returned to Rainey's bedside, read the 23rd Psalm, kissed her goodbye and said rest. Later upon her ordination, Polly often served as guest preacher, but focused her ministry on caring for the elderly those who were homebound, hospitalized, or in hospice care. This congregation was never able to gather in the same room, yet they were bound together in prayer and by the tenderness they received from Pauli during their final days. Now the pastoral care Pauli provided was informed by personal experience. She did her required clinical pastoral education training at Bellevue Hospital in New York where decades before, she had been brought for psychiatric care. Between 1937 and 1947, Polly was hospitalized three times for emotional breakdowns. Repeatedly, she'd asked doctors to perform exploratory surgery because she believed she had hidden male sex organs. If doctors would just find the answer, prescribe some male hormones, maybe she could find some peace from her distress, she thought. During one hospitalization in Amityville, New York, she pressed doctors for explanations. Where do you think is the seat of the conflict? In the brain, the body, the glands, or where? Where could I go to get an answer? What fields are doing experimentation and have the equipment? Why this nervous, excitable condition all my life and the very natural falling in love with the female sex? Terrific breakdowns after each love affair becomes unsuccessful. Why the willingness to fight instead of running away in this instance? During other hospital stays, there were no questions, no words, just tears. As a law student, when Polly's romantic interest in a sophomore at Howard University became public and drew criticism, she had to be taken to Friedman's Hospital. There she sobbed uncontrollably and had to be sedated. The hospital records are difficult to read because it's clear that she had no appetite, few visitors, and was overwhelmed with grief. What Polly needed during her hospitalizations was tenderness, and decades later, she offered it to others. It's important to note, however, <clears throat> that Polly's tenderness extended beyond humans to canine companions. 
These included Petey, a German shepherd who was by her side while she discerned whether to go to law school, Smokey, um, who went with Polly to Ghana, and another long haired dog with black and white coat that she got after receiving her doctorate. Polly gave this dog two names, Doc and black and white together we shall overcome. During the early years of her ministry, Roy, a black Labrador, sat next to her while she wrote her sermons. When a landlord in Virginia decided Roy didn't meet the weight restrictions and Roy was 50 pounds over the limit, Polly wrote an open letter for the Washington Post to garner support for her dog extolling his loyalty and other virtues. But what's most obvious in that letter is her deep affection for the dog and insistence that he be treated lovingly. And the final um, charism that I wanna lift up is imagination. Imagination is one charism that Polly both prizes in others and recognizes in herself. For Polly, imagination involves more than being clever. It has a mystical quality. The person with imagination is a seer of sorts, able to discern unseen spiritual realities in the temporal sphere. In an address entitled, what the Protestant Episcopal Church of the USA could be doing 1975 to 2075, Pauli says, I identify imagination with Imago Dei, the image of God, and with the bestowal of the Holy Spirit. Imagination in the human sense permits us to have a vision of the life to come after death, of life in our human existence for decades to come, of the possibility of transforming ambiguities, contradictions, anger, hostility, human limitations into positive and creative acts touched by the Holy Spirit. And it's important to note that for Pauli, racism was not only violent and tragic, but unimaginative. It reflected a failure to imagine the wonder of human personhood, instead focusing narrowly on the accidents of race and gender. And by using the term accident, Pauli did not intend to suggest that these aspects of identity do not matter or that we should look past them, rather that no single aspect of one's identity can convey the fullness of who we are. Honoring the dignity of the human person required being mindful of our manyness. Polly once described herself as, quote, a woman of color who was also over age 70 and short and hard of hearing and left-handed and all of it counted. Polly knew all too well the pain of being defined by race and gender. When it came to race, she had childhood memories of being called half-breed and yellow at school. And though teased at as too light at school, at home, her beloved grandmother treated her as too dark, telling her to stay out of the sun, that her lips were too thick and hair too curly. Throughout her life, Polly proudly described herself as Negro, but even during the Black Power Movement of the 1970s, resisted the term Black. Nor am I white, she said. I am both. I stand between the races, clinging to both, trying to bring them together. She resisted the notion of a Black-White binary thinking the idea that blacks and whites were somehow opposites of one another impeded the work of racial reconciliation. Polly's great-grandmother, Harriet Smith, had white and indigenous ancestry. Many of the details of her story are unknown, 
but Polly documents what she knows in her family memoir, Proud Shoes. There, Polly explains that Harriet was enslaved and counted as Negro, despite being Cherokee and likely having no African ancestry. Her heritage was erased when at age 15, she was purchased by Dr. James Smith for $450 and enslaved on his plantation as his daughter's maid. This pattern of dismissing, lumping, and assigning racial identity for economic gain has a long history in the United States. And um, if you're interested in reading more about that, Jason Mancini has done some um, great research on this. But of course, Pauli also knew that in addition to race, Harriet's gender was also treated as fungible. Hortense Spillers argues that chattel slavery resulted in a pattern of ungendering black flesh or flesh deemed black. Enslaved women worked in fields like men, often immediately after childbirth. Whether in the field or in the house, norms of dignity, privacy and gentleness that were accorded to white women were emphatically withheld from enslaved women. Gender served the demands of profit making. C. Riley Snorton, author of Black on Both Sides, A Racial History of Trans Identity, says stripping enslaved people of the norms of gender was part of the quote, blackening of blackness, part of the burden of living as a being within the zone of non-being. Snorton goes on to say, blackness functioned as a site for an elaboration of gender in which the fungible interchangeability of sex for chattel persons revealed gender within blackness to be a polymorphous proposition. Knowing gender could be flu a fluid proposition for market purposes, Polly found it frustrating that this openness did not follow in discussions of individual freedom. In 1978, while serving as a guest lecturer at Virginia Theological Seminary in a class on Christian freedom, she asked students, how do we know in this whole question of sexuality that there aren't intermediate sexes? Someone says there are five sexes. She went on to mention a case at Duke University Hospital in which a person was undergoing gender affirming surgery and asked if students were keeping up with the process. They were silent. She said, well, you ought to read about it. In that setting, Polly does not talk about her own experience, but explains that she was rethinking what she knew of quote, homosexuality, transsexuality and hermaphrodism. She added that the church should not rush to take a position if the church doesn't know what it's talking about. Overall, Pauli wanted to see the church honor human diversity and embrace a more robust vision of personhood. And facing the complexities of race and gender would require divine help. One form of which was the charism of imagination. While she saw no substitute for long-standing collective action to end inequality, Pauli felt it was essential for everyone to nurture a fuller self-understanding grounded in manyness. I think she expresses her vision best in a poem aptly entitled, Prophecy. I sing of a new American, separate from all others, yet enlarged and diminished by all others. I am the child of kings and serfs, freemen and slaves, having neither superiors nor inferiors, progeny of all colors, all cultures, all systems, all beliefs. I have been enslaved, yet my spirit is unbound. I have been cast aside, but I sparkle in the darkness. I have been slain, but live on in the rivers of history. 
I seek no conquest, no wealth, no power, no revenge. I seek only discovery of the illimitable heights and depths of my own being. While Pauli had the charisms of scrappiness, tenderness, and imagination, another proved elusive, patience. Through most of Pauli's life, patience took effort. And this is because she felt the urgency of the historical moment and sought to bring about change. Pauli never wanted to concede to the gradualism that shaped American democratic thought during the 20th century, especially concerning intersectional identity and the pattern of black women being asked to defer for the progress of black men. Pauli's urgency sometimes led to overwork and exhaustion. Over time, she learned that she was one person, not a committee, that she had intrinsic limits. She took solace in knowing that the fruit of one's life work exceeds one's lifetime and, and does so in ways visible and invisible. Our work continues to reverberate. I hope it's clear that Pauli's charisms were not focused on self-actualization, but on glorifying God, ushering in a new and freer reality for all, and triumphing over doubt and fear. For that, Pauli argued, is where we find the ultimate meaning of human existence. It seems fitting to close this lecture on Pauli Murray with the words of the poet, Lucille Clifton. And I'll invite you to share image H um, as I read this final poem by Lucille Clifton. It's called, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come, celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Thank you for listening. And I'm interested in your questions. Dr. McCray, thank you for that wonderful talk. And oh. I just want to thank you for introducing me to the stunning Polly Murray, who I had really no knowledge about. And every step of her life story, I, just gets more and more extraordinary as it went on. So it, it's such an incredible life and so rich. And, and the readings uh, that you uh, gave uh, from her works are, are really overwhelming. So I just mm -hmm. want to thank you for introducing, introducing me, maybe others um, as well. Or I'm not sure if others have heard of uh, Holly Murray before, but Thank you so much. And let me quickly then open this up to uh, questions. And so if there are any questions, please uh, do uh, raise your hands. Nick, please. Nick is one of our PhD students. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I was curious, you mentioned at the very beginning that she had lived in some sort of ashram in New York City, but it didn't have a she didn't agree with this, if I understood it correctly. But some the way you described her, especially when you refer to the children of God, it sounds very Gandhian as well as Christian. Was she heavily influenced by him as well? Yes. Um, so, Polly, yes, Polly was very um, heavily influenced by Gandhi. Um, I should note um, that the ashram... Um, required the members to draw on a combination of um, Christian principles, Gandhian principles, principles, and nonviolent action. And um, one of the members of that ashram was Bayer Rustin, 
uh, another very well-known um, freedom fighter um, for racial, um, uh, racial and gender equality. Um, so Pauli drew on Gandhian principles um, in 1940 during that incident when um, um, arrested for sitting in the white section of a segregated Greyhound bus. And while in jail, um, she and Adeline McBean, who was her companion at the time, um, specifically drew on Gandhian principles, wrote about them, and um, talked about them um, when exploring their, their legal defense. Um, so this was an influence of Pauli's. Thank you for, for asking that. So it's an important um, part of Pauli's commitment to nonviolence. Thank you. Joy, Joy Plasios, please, yeah. Uh, Dr. McCray, thank you so much. I, I feel so lifted up by uh, learning about um, about Polly's life. Uh, like uh, like Carolyn, I, I didn't know her or her work and and um, I'm sad that I didn't and glad that I do now know more than I did before. I was really, um, I really liked the way uh, she understood imagination as a charism. And I was wondering if in her work, she um, talked or preached about how to foster imagination. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's such a good question. Um, so there are two pieces to it. Um, on one level, Pauli saw imagination as a charism, as a, a gift of the Holy Spirit. And um, it being a gift mean, meant that one um, just received it miraculously. At the other, on the other hand, Pauli believed, um, as with patience, that one can, um, with effort, build certain skills. And one key part of developing imagination was to um, be engaged in freedom movements, to see how other people were um, navigating the world, to um, reflect on um, movements for freedom in other parts of the world. And, um, and actually in one sermon, she mentions um, the problem of a priest who cancels his New York Times subscription because he thinks that all the stories of war and espionage are disrupting his inner peace. This, <laughs> this is a problem because um, one needs to know um, what's going on, even the painful things, in order to develop the skill of imagining how things could be different and what steps need to be taken in order to um, enact a different future. So I'd say the short answer is to engage with other people, um, have a global sense of oneself, and to um, be involved in freedom movements. Thank you. Reading and research was also another huge, um, for her students at Brandeis, um, she really felt like that was a big part of growing in one's imagination. To hear that, students, that's very important. <laughs> <laughs> that's very important. Rachel Schmidt, please. Yeah. Oh, Rachel, you're muted. I think you're muted. You're muted. I always forget to do that. Thank you so much. I wish I had known about Apostle Pauli my whole life. <laughs> my childhood would have been so much easier. <laughs> I'm so glad you're working on her. Um, so I I just am so moved by the way she understood charismas, charisms, and, and thought about the women in her whole life as having charisms. And... Um, I, I just think that's so freed, and mm. I really wonder if you could speak more about, I mean, you've talked about scrappiness as a charism, which I love. The way she understood that as part of, obviously, she had the charisma of prophecy, and, and the way she um, understood her own charisma of prophecy. Yeah, so, you know, um, so my um, research really focuses on Polly as a preacher. 
Okay. Because Pauli describes preaching as um, my most difficult problem. And it's, this is a problem for a number of reasons. One is that preaching involves, um, at least in her context, showing up physically in a pulpit and preaching and, and engaging the, the body and um, cultural assumptions about embodiment. Um, but another piece is that Pauli's preaching manifests in a number of different ways. Um, uh, it's in letter writing, as I explained, you know, in keeping with the Apostle Paul's model, but also um, in poetry. Pauli said that um, sermons and poetry were, um, oh, she, she didn't use the term um, sister disciplines, but she des describes them um, using a metaphor as uh, siblings, sermons and poems. And um, poems are really her first um, steps into prophecy. Mm -hmm. um, they're ways that she um, engages contemporary, um, the contemporary world in the news, um, but also ways that she shares her faith. So Pauli's prophecy includes, you know, the formal sermons given um, in church, includes letters, includes um, poems, and activism, which she saw as in keeping with, um, you know, prophets like Isaiah, who um, preach an embodied message, you know, um, it wasn't just what they were saying, but their speech acts were prophetic. So it's a very broad um, understanding of what preaching entails, broader than um, the Episcopal Church's understanding at that time, for sure. I hope that answers your question. If that, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Tinu Ruparel, please. Yep. Um, thank you so much. Um, like my colleagues, uh, wonderful, wonderful talk uh, and pleasure to be introduced to Polly Murray. I have a question. I'm really curious about this bigger question that you pose in the title of your talk, but how do we know what a charism is or how, we, how do we decide? I'm just curious how <clears throat> Murray dealt with her Anglican roots or Episcopalian roots, the, the three stools of Anglicanism, what's three leg, legged stool of Anglicanism is um, uh, scripture, uh, reason, and tradition. I think in that that order. And so I'm wondering what what was her negotiation with um, the powers of the Episcopal Church at the time, considering this question about how one decides what is uh, a charism? Yes. So um, Pauli understood that one aspect of reason was experience. And so human experience had to be taken as seriously as um, scripture and tradition. So you could almost think of it as a four-legged stool for her, you know, reason, experience, scripture and tradition. And, um, you know, part of this is because Pauli has such a very high view of human personhood, um, but also because there are limits to reason, right? There are things that despite decades of effort, an individual human being will not understand. And so we have to um, pay close attention to human experience and treat that reverently as a medium for discerning divine action. Did I, 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 lot, I, yeah, I, I, did she get a lot of pushback from bishops and well, archbishops yeah. and stuff? Yeah, well, so, um, you know, the Episcopal Church is um, so diverse, and it, it was so at that time, that, um, you know, she got pushed back from people like um, Reverend Watley from the Coalition of Apostolic Ministry, but there were so many more people in the church who deeply resonated with that, who were hungry for an articulation of faith that took seriously um, the ver variety and complexity of human experience. So she probably got more support than she did resistance. Um, and that's really a function more of the circles that she moved in. Um, and the fact that she was deeply embedded, even after her graduation, um, 
in the seminary community around um, Virginia Theological Seminary. So that kind of helped and shaped the kind of circle of conversation she was a part of. Thank you. Marika. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. And I, I'm, um, I, I'm a medievalist, so I'm, I'm going to ask a, maybe a random question, but I, I work on gender theory and, in, and feminist scholarship in Byzantium. And, and one of the things I'm always fascinated about is um, for, 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 this, for this figure, for your own work, I would love to know how you came to this research. Um, mm -hmm. Because I find that so many, so many of these fascinating figures um, are sidelined. We don't necessarily see them until somebody brings them to the light. And I, I would love to know how you, how you came to this work because it's absolutely fascinating. Mm. Um, so my first introduction to Polly Murray was um, in a class on um, black feminist thought that I took um, as an undergraduate. Um, there's a short piece on Polly Murray in an anthology that we read. Um, and then another really brief introduction while as when I was a law student because Polly Murray's um, work in um, uh, gender discrimination was significant. But that was a, when I say sliver, teeny piece. The, the real introduction came when I was asked as a, um, a junior faculty member at my seminary to lead what was called Fridays at the seminary, meaning we need you to find someone that you can talk about for four hours. And um, you can talk about it for two hours, everybody has lunch, and then talk about it for another two hours. And I, you know, agonized, what am I going to talk about, you know? And I started doing research on Polly Murray in preparation for that day-long experience. And I just, I just fell in love, you know, I, it was like, I felt like Polly came to me, you know, <laughs> and I went and did some research, um, Polly's papers are at the Schlesinger at Harvard, and I was looking at her library card and felt, I, we are going to spend some time together and it's going to be a lot more than four hours. Uh, so that was really the beginning of my fascination and really deep study of Polly Murray's life. Um, but, you know, I guess the other piece of it is I was really interested in someone who came into ministry from another vocation, which is, you know, my own experience and who I, I'm a lay person, she's ordained, but to be clear, um, and someone who had spent some time doing hospice. That was another um, attraction. So um, there was just a lot that fascinated me and that's why I stayed with it. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're making us all fall in love with Polly Murray. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. And uh, George, would you please uh, ask your question? Oh, George, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for your talk. In preparation for it, uh, I should preface, uh, uh, like Marika and Carol and, and others here, no doubt, I, I also am a medievalist. And uh, much of my work deals with um, uh, saints, cults, and canonizations. So I was intrigued when I came across a journalistic piece uh, on Polly Murray that referred to her, listed all her many attributes. And the last of this list was saint. And yes. I'm wondering the extent to which uh, uh, the uh, Episcopalian church uh, has or has not uh, honored her memory with this label. Would you know? Yes, so um, Polly is included in a volume called Holy Women, Holy Men, um, celebrating the saints. And so that's where the sainthood language comes from. And um, this is, it's a broad number of, uh, broad range of human lives that are reflected in this volume. 
And um, Polly Saint Day is July 1st, uh, the day of her death. And there are a good number of observances of worship services honoring Polly Murray in different parts of the country. Um, when I was in, living in Durham, North Carolina, there was one every year at St. Titus, Polly's home church. Um, but there are also um, frequently celebrations in Baltimore um, because of the family connections. Um, and there are commemorations um, here. So um, that, that day is, um, you know, picking up steam, if you will. Um, more people are honoring it. I think that, you know, the questions about race and gender identity in Polly Murray's life are increasingly drawing the interest of um, people today, um, especially younger people. Uh, uh, Barbara Lau, who heads the Polly Murray Project, has said that Polly brings to, together conversation partners who one wouldn't ordinarily expect to come together. And that is um, older white members of the Episcopal Church, young um, activists, um, people from um, a broad array of um, LGBTQIA communities, and people interested in the law. And they're all brought together in Polly Murray. So some of these Saints Day observances bring people who ordinarily would not um, come to church or um, be, or if they do um, identify as Christian and, att and attend worship services, um, don't really have a high view of saints, but want to come for other reasons to learn about Polly Murray. Great. Thank you so much. Again, not just for your answer, but for your your marvelous presentation. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful note to end on because it was a marvelous presentation. And we're lucky to say that we have another one coming tomorrow. Um, Dr. McRae is going to be giving the Chair of Christian Thought Bento Lecture on Christian Education and Theology. And Dr. McRae is going to be looking at Quilter as Truth Teller, Harriet Powers, Rosie Lee Tompkins, and their Stitch Sermons. And I'm so excited to, uh, to, to hear that. And it's tomorrow at 1 p.m. And uh, information on how to register for that is on our departmental webpage. Or if you need more information, please just let me know and I can give you further details. But let me just say, Thank you from me and from the department uh, for giving your time and teaching us about this incredible person and doing it so beautifully. Thank you so much, Dr. McRae. And we're looking forward to tomorrow very much. Thank you. Hope to see everybody tomorrow as well. Have a good evening. <laughs>